Hello, everyone. Before I introduce our awesome speakers today, I just want to have a quick shout out to our awesome sponsors and, and uh, mention that if you haven't checked out the Cougar Village, do do so. They're doing resume review and mock interview and all that awesome stuff. So today we have Connie and Tara joining us from Google, and their talk is titled Beyond the Office, Work from Home, and the Long Tail of Zero Trust. Very interesting stuff, and the stage is yours. Hello, everybody. I am Antra, uh, and I have my co-presenter here with me, Connie. Um, so today we are going to be talking about the building blocks of a zero trust model, like a zero trust security model, and Google's own version of it called Beyond Corp. We will also go over how this model enabled Google to safely send our entire workforce to work remotely during the COVID crisis, and also what adjustments had to be made along the way. So before we go deeper, um, a little bit about me. I'm currently working as a security engineer in Google's enterprise infrastructure, uh, focusing mainly on access control. Um, prior to joining Google, I completed my in information security from Johns Hopkins University. Um, and in my free time, I just love exploring new music, charming with my friends, and also volunteer my time to educate the underprivileged kids. Um, I'll pass it over to Connie to introduce herself. Yep. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Connie. Uh, I am also a secondary security engineer at Google, working currently on vulnerability management. But for the last um, two, three years, I worked on access control with Antara. And before Google, I worked in security automation and detection and graduated from Drexel University with a BSMS in information systems. Uh, during quarantine, I've been doing a bunch of different things, including learning how to make kimchi imperfectly, bothering my cat, and uh, trying to grow a plant hoard, and I don't know, watching it slowly shrink in size. But uh, <laughs> yeah, um, now we'll go on to the talk. So for an overview of the talk, uh, we're gonna cover why Beyond Corp, what is Beyond Corp, how to build it yourself, and the long tail. So now um, I guess I'll start with why Beyond Corp. Some of you might be wondering why our Zero Trust initiative is called Beyond Corp. Um, Corp is a pseudonym for our corporate infrastructure. So around 2009, we realized that our existing infrastructure was flawed. So we embarked on this over a decade long journey to reimagine our infrastructure. So we wanted this new thing to be more secure, enable folks to work outside of our existing physical locations. And we made it, a, um, we ended up making all of our internal apps publicly accessible. So we ended up naming this thing Beyond Corp. Um, also to clear some things up, we now have a product ca uh, called Beyond Corp as well. And it takes a lot of the lessons that we've learned in, um, from this journey and tries to make that solution more accessible for um, other people. So this presentation is not about that product, product called Beyond Corp, but it is about the why, how, and challenges of implementing zero trust yourself. So um, with that, let's dive into the why. So, what Google had before was a fortress model, also known as a perimeter defense model. Um, in many ways, this is still the industry standard. And in this fortress model, you basically take all your valuables, all your, your servers, your clients, um, any other infrastructure that you need to make it happen. So that's like network devices or um, other glue, and you put them in one big pile, and then you big, uh, build a big strong wall around it. So at the end of that, you have all your goodies on the inside of this wall, which you consider your trusted zone. And then you have all the bad things on the outside of this impenetrable wall. And um, that's the untrusted zone. So the only way to cross between these two zones should be via a guarded entry point. Uh, and this is typically done using VPN technology that lets you pass the firewalls. So this is definitely a bit simplistic of a picture. Um, as an industry, we, we, you know, we found some shortcomings in this model. So we started adding multiple layers of walls, moving to you know, the casino model with concentric layers of ever increasing security, uh, or sorry, ever increasing sensitivity of the assets inside, or DMZs uh, to borrow, borrow an analogy from the military uh, with demilitarized zones, 
where you might put things that the public needs to access, but you still need to push content to it from your own corporate services. Um, but overall, this is how most organizations implement their internet and how Google used to do it. So now let's dive uh, into the flaws that I mentioned before. Um, the Fortress models, as I just explained, relies on this impenetrable wall separating the trusted and untrusted zones. This is almost never true in reality that the wall is impenetrable. We needed to enable productivity, which often means allowing outbound connections for people that need to figure out how to exit Vim or see memes and email threads. Security is always like a cat and mouse game. So, you know, malware quickly figured out that uh, to proliferate and, and figure out how to like work in such an environment, they just needed to have the infected client initiate the connection to their CNC server outside of the environment. Um, as well, the security of the devices accessing um, corporate data was kind of like an afterthought. It's on the inside of this wall, right? So nothing bad can happen to it. It's all trusted. Uh, but the machine is also part of the attack surface if it can reach the sensitive data and create a copy of it locally. So now what happens if the machine or the um, hard drive is ever taken out of the perimeter? Well, now we have unprotected corporate data out in the wild. Uh, we introduced you know, antivirus and um, intrusion prevention detection systems on those hosts, but uh, it kind of helped cover some of the gaps, but didn't solve the issue entirely. So now we have firewalls, VPNs, maybe machine certs, proxy and firewall block lists, host a bunch of like host-based thing, host things. And that's a lot of disconnected data sources and enforcement mechanisms. So responding to incidents were um, was often like a very time intensive uh, and laggy process. We'd have to get an alert, investigate, parse logs, revoke machine certs um, to kind of cut off the additional access. And every one of those steps takes time. To make up for those issues, like we said previously, the we kind of just doubled down at adding more walls or trying to like, you know, kind of shove solutions in, in those gaps that we found. But you know, at Google, it seemed to us that there were some fundamental issues in this assumption that the model is based on, and just kind of um, continuing to patch over it like wouldn't solve the problem. So, in addition to these pre-existing issues, um, we also had some new changes that were like challenging the underlying assumption of the Fortress model. Most of these things aren't new, but they were fairly new about a decade ago when we started on this journey. So the first one of those is the increasingly mobile workforce. This kind of broke the assumption that clients were always on the inside of those physical locations that we controlled. So um, with this mobile workforce, vulnerable and compromised devices were regularly brought in and outside of the perimeter, and we needed to use the VPN to stretch the castle wall to those remote devices. On top of that, we had a plethora of client devices used by those, um, this mobile workforce. So now we had to support new device types, cell phones, tablets, laptops, on top of um, traditional laptop desktops. And we ran into VPN usability issues on those types of devices. We needed to make it, um, we needed to make our workforce able to work regardless of where they were and what kind of device they were using. The third thing was the emergence of cloud services and software as a service. That meant that a bunch of our corporate services were no longer on-prem. They actually were you know, outside our perimeter somewhere in various data centers around the world. So we had to poke holes in our perimeter to allow those services to function. And that further blurred our traditional perimeter and, and trust domain assumptions. Um, remember when like vendor security was a new hot topic in security? Uh, that was like right around when all well, kind of like Target and Home Depot were breached, if you guys remember that. Um, so the last thing that the kind of all of that combined to lead us to have concerns about our security posture and how much our threat model actually covered our attack surface and our ability to respond to ever increasingly sophisticated attacks that we were seeing. So in late 2009, we also had an event that kind of pushed all of this to, to its head. Um, Google discovered that we were a victim of a targeted APT attack tied to the People's Republic of China. This ended up being named Operation Aurora, and it affected dozens of US-based companies, 
Google wasn't the only one. We were just the first to publicly disclose, disclose it in January 2010. Um, as a result, we pulled Google search out of China. The first photo is from an ad, ad hoc memorial that people made out of one of our, um, the, the Google signs in front of one of our China offices. So this was a huge deal because it demonstrated that, demonstrated all of our fears about lateral movement um, in the fortress model. Uh, the attackers were able to move around our environment and exfiltrate source code and were looking to target uh, emails of human rights activists. And this was the first big APT attack that targeted private entities, but we knew it wouldn't be the last. So all of that led to a realization that no matter how many walls, how high they were, how thick they are, that walls don't work. And there would always be a soft, vulnerable center. So we went back to first principles and decided to remove the walls completely. So now I'll pass it on to Antara to go over what is Beyond Corp. Thank you, Connie, for that history right there. <laughs> so earlier, we kept saving our infrastructure by putting more and more walls around the perimeter, right? Like Connie just explained. And it's not easy, easy to scale. And we also realized that walls don't work. So let's talk about like what is Beyond Corp, also known as the zero trust model. Uh, but in order to understand zero trust, let's look at a particular scenario first. So look at this picture and imagine like a cosmopolitan city uh, and all these are employees that are mingling with anybody on the street. Like if I ask you, can you really tell who is an authorized user simply based on where they stand on the street? Probably not, right? So think of this position in the street as like a node in the network, right? The point I'm making is that you shouldn't be relying on determining who is an authorized user just based on where they are in the network or which network uh, they come from. Like for reasons Connie just stated, right? Like walls don't work. So instead we want to identify them based on their identity and what device they have in their back pocket. And this is the foundational principle of a zero trust model. To put this into words, there are three core principles that come out of this scenario. The first and foremost is the first principle is that we no longer determine who you are based on your IP address. So in other words, like your location doesn't matter at all. Like you're coming from a coffee shop or you're coming from the inside the office, it shouldn't matter. The second is like access to a service should only be granted based on what we know about the user that is you, right? And the device that is initiating the connection. And obviously there's a lot of complexity that goes into determining the state of the device. And we will talk about that a little more in detail in the preceding slides. Uh, third and last core security principle is that device, no matter where it is in the world, has the ability to connect to our cloud services in a very safe and secure manner. So in other words, like all traffic should be authenticated, authorized and encrypted, no matter where you come from. These foundational principles actually helped us define our mission statement. So what were we trying to achieve? Like what was our mission when we talk about these principles, right? We wanted to completely re-architect our infrastructure to move away from a perimeter model that is remove any privileges that have been granted solely based on the IP address or like the location. Uh, to redefine, like to put it into simpler words, like completely remove the need for a privileged corporate network. Don't trust the corporate intranet any more than you trust the public internet. Or to put it into a more like understandable and user-facing definition, we wanted to enable every Googler to work successfully from anywhere in the world, from any device, and without needing a VPN. What this in effect means is we are putting all of our internal corporate application out on the public-facing internet, while still enabling a safe and secure access, and in turn, protecting our data. And this, in fact, is a big deal, right? So let's see how do we actually build our own zero trust by going over like the building blocks of um, the zero trust model. But before we dive deep, one thing to remember is that zero trust is not a technology, right? It's just a methodology. And with it comes a lot of reliance on all these systems working coherently in sync. So we'll go in, into like what builds such a model and what was our uh, Beyond Corp model. If you look at this, this is a very high level uh, diagram of the four major components of Beyond Corp that we're gonna be talking about. 
um, and that is identity, which is the user, uh, the context, which is the device that's initiating the, uh, the connection, the rules engine, which is the central policy engine that defines all your access control, and then you have the enforcement point, which is basically where all the connections uh, terminate. Let's let's go into each of these components a little more in detail. Um, the first and the foremost is the user, right? So talking about the user, the most basic foundational concept is like you need to know your users. So the need to have like a good and accurate knowledge of your users is very necessary. Now this isn't something new in the security world. Like you obviously most companies have an active directory with information about the users, but what's important. Uh, is to be able to track like the entire life cycle of a user. And that's exactly what we do here at Google. So in order to provide access to a particular service, you need to know who actually needs it. Like following the principles of least privilege, which is like a core security principle, right? Just following that, like we have pretty fine grained controls on which user is allowed to access what. And we are obviously working on improving that every day because scale. <laughs> So we, we track HR attributes about a user, we check which job function they belong to, and then we provision access based on these attributes. We've also strengthened our authentication by adding more and more security controls. So for example, abuse detection. What, so what can we detect about like the anomalies in these login behavior, right? We've also moved on to replace uh, OTPs with security keys for two-factor authentic authentication. And one thing to remember is these keys are inherently phishing proof and phishing resistance and provides a very strong authentication mechanism. So it's, it's, it's a big, big win from moving away from OTPs. Um, the third most very important thing we did for strong authentication is session length control. So we cut down the session length, making users re-authenticate after a certain period of time has elapsed. So this reduces the risk of session hijacking, credential theft by ensuring that you know sessions that were only on machines actively used by the users are actually allowed. Otherwise, you can imagine like there would be like active logins and credentials all over the place, which actually spreads out the attack surface a lot. Moving on to the second most important component of this uh, zero trust is the device that is initiating the connection. So we put a lot of effort in determining the latest state of the device. So if you remember, we moved completely away from a model of network location trust to what we know about the devices. And hence, it's very important to understand its latest state. So like one of the basic prerequisites is that it probably is used is in the traditional model as well, is to keep an accurate inventory of the devices connecting to your infrastructure. And obviously this inventory should tie a device with a particular unique ID. So suppose we use machine certificates. But what's important in a zero trust model is that we are able to accurately calculate the trust we have in a device based on various attributes. So for example, like is the device up to date? Does it have the latest security patches? Does it have the latest config? Is it running on a trusted operating system? Is just in encryption enabled? Is secure boot enabled? Like what are the security uh, health logs that are, be that are being received from the device? Like what's its latest state, et cetera, et cetera. Like this is like a very small subset of what we actually check for the device. But based on these answers that we get for these questions, we, we basically assign a trust tier uh, to the particular device, device, right? So there are different le levels of trust that you can have in a particular device from minimally trusted to fully trusted and et cetera. So how do we actually calculate all this trust? Uh, and we'll, we'll just go like, this is also pretty high level on how we calculate. There's a lot of complexity that goes into this. But from high level, if you see this diagram, there are few important components I want to just highlight here in the device um, life cycle management. One thing you see on the top, the colorful piece, which is the device database. This is a centralized data warehouse, which contains information about devices in our corporate environment from various several data sources. So we keep track of devices from the time it's procured to its end of life. And every update on the device from tiny details about their even like the NIC changes on the device, that's updated to this particular inventory, right? And then what happens, the second most important component is the device inference service that you see on the right side. This is responsible for interpreting facts about the device information that we are getting, that it gets from the database. And then it makes decisions about what 
trust tier that particular device um, should be assigned to, obviously identified by its certificate, right? Based on all of this information, imagine like if we identify a malware, we have the ability to immediately uh, bring down the trust level of a service from, suppose it was a fully trusted and we identify a malware, we can easily bring it down to minimally trusted or not trusted, and that will immediately stop uh, that device being able to access any of our services or applications. And that, that's a big thing, right? That's an like, automatic, uh, we are able to bring down the trust and stop it from connecting any further to our services. So all of this trust information about the device and the user, all of this information then feeds into the access rule engines, which was the third uh, major component to be able to make access control decisions. So as we have a great inventory of users and devices and we track its entire life cycle, it gives us the ability to configure access control list based on this trust data. So we define access poli policies based on like what's the state of the, which user is connecting, is it the user active, what's the state of the device, is it healthy, et cetera, right? And all of this then feeds into our rules engine that makes all these access decisions. Um, so yeah, it's based on what we know about the user. Like, I'm just gonna press more about this point, like what we know about the user and what we know about the device based on the trust level. These rules uh, then inform our enforcement point. So on, on the next slide, we see like, think of this enforcement point like a proxy layer, right? So all enterprise applications at Google are exposed to the internal and external clients via an internet facing proxy. So this is an internet facing proxy that enforces encryption between the client and the application. Um, and one thing to note is the access proxy is configured for each application and provides some common features such as global reachability, load balancing. It also terminates the TLS connection uh, for the client. Access control checks um, and reliability work is like even denial of service actually. So if you, if you think about it, a lot, lot of security and reliability work is automatically done for a particular service at this proxy level. So bringing up a service internally is, is much faster um, that way. This proxy then basically delegates request as appropriate to the backend application after all these access control checks are done. So all of Google's enterprise applications are exposed externally and are registered in the public DNS with a C name pointing to the applications um, at this uh, internet facing proxy. Uh, if, you, if you look at the diagram again, so we, this is the same diagram, the same four major components, a little more deeper with, with the flow diagrams. This is still a very high level diagram, uh, but if you see how, how all of them come together. On the right, you have the user database, you have the machine database. All of this data feeds into the pipeline on the top that then calculates trust uh, to make secure access decisions, right? And these decisions are made at the rules engine on the top there. So when a connection is initiated, the enforcement point interacts basically with the rules engine to make like a holistic access control uh, decision for that particular connection. And one, very important thing to note is that all of this information is checked constantly for every connection that is initiated. So every connection is vetted the same way without any inherent trust in that connection. And this is a very important point because if you compare this to the traditional perimeter model, when a user is basically authenticated, the machine might be authenticated with the machine cert, but check is typically done one time. And after that user and device are due to their network location, right? Which when you compare it to Beyond Corp, where there is no longer an implicit trust if you're inside the network, this heavily cuts down lateral movement if you think about it, right? But it's a complex architecture. This is a very dumbed down high level uh, view of that architecture. And with all of this complexity, I'll take a pause to think about this architecture, but there comes a long tail. Uh, of this, so we began this work in 2010 and the work is still ongoing in a, in a way, right? So I'm gonna pass it on to Connie to go into the details on the long tail, which is very important. Yeah, thanks, Hunter. Um, so yeah, after all you said, the, uh, after you said all, all those pieces, uh, there's still a good amount of work to be done. So may, the, there's a 
a couple different themes for a lot of the work that we've been working on still. Uh, one of the, the main one is finishing what we started. So, so for the first one of those is a privilege networks turned down. Uh, when we first turned up Beyond Corp, we hardened our infrastructure, we turned on public internet access for all of our internal applications, and we migrated our on-premise employees to a new untrusted network. Um, and this that whole transition was so seamless that some of our remote employees thought that, you know, that they were able to access our internal applications without a VPN was like a security flaw and an accident. So uh, that was kind of a fun story for our response teams, like getting those reports of like, hey, did you guys mean to do that? Um, but in order to make that transition as seamless as it was, we had to keep up the privilege network for use cases that still relied on the implicit network trust. And we've still been working on removing those exceptions and are almost nearing turndown. The second part of that is we needed to support non-compatible hardware. So removing those privileged network exceptions means that our, those exceptions like existed often because there were non-supported cases. And um, in general, that meant anything that used like proprietary protocols, weird ports, uh, expected unfettered network access, or had minimal auth and LC support. And an example of that would be building management systems. They're generally expected to just kind of have open L2 access to what, whatever they needed and um, didn't have too much like authentication support. So another example of things that um, we had to find an, another solution for was um, things that had high throughput, low latency, or required peer-to-peer -peer traffic. And that didn't work well with um, you know, our setup because Beyond Corp relies heavily on an access proxy. And with an access proxy, you have to be able to direct those connections to that proxy, um, you know, enable that software to use our AuthNLC or delegate that to our, our service and also not overwhelm our proxy's bandwidth or um, be able to handle the, the minor latency um, that the you know, trip to the proxy and that the, the trip to the proxy would add. So there's a bunch of things that we kind of relied on to kind of fix this. It was um, a mix. Sometimes we changed vendors for some things we're rolling out uh, software-defined networking and maybe even a little bit of VPN in some places. Um, so the last thing is also just removing legacy configurations. So I would recommend uh, just a general recommendation, finish your rollouts and remediations. Um, you know, this is a, a pretty complex environment with a, a lot of um, different moving pieces. Uh, and so like, you know, left unfinished, pretty much the environment gets more fractured and complicated over time. And there's like increasingly a few breadcrumbs or people that know enough things to enable you to figure out what's going on. So for example, when we suddenly went, um, sent all of our, our workforce to home, we ran into some issues because we never removed a legacy configuration in a specific environment that required network trust. And as a result, when those services were like suddenly unreachable out of office, our SREs had to like go digging into old documentation and like do some sleuthing to figure out what was responsible and then make a, you know, a kind of like hasty change, which is never what you want in a production environment. Um, so and the second theme of the thing of our long tail work is increasing protections for devices. Um, the first thing is that we've increased the coverage of the security measurements that we're pulling from, de from devices. We went from, are you up to date? Are you in inventory to collecting um, data on security agent health, packages installed, patch level, certificate data, user observed or in inventory as Antara mentioned in the earlier sections. All of that was to kind of improve our confidence and being able to say that the machine uh, that we're seeing is the one we think it is, and that machine is a secure one. Um, also, when things moved off-premise, we had to shift more of our um, protections and detections to the host. That was um, you know, true in the, the pre-zero uh, trust world, but also true in here. But I think the main difference with you know zero trust is that things are already moving off-premise in the Fortress model. So this is kind of us just 
kind of baking that into the model and uh, integrating everything so it worked seamlessly. The second thing that we worked on was uh, tightening the controls on those um, on the devices. So a main differentiator, as I said, with BeyondCorp is tying those device checks to access to data. So um, an example would be like if a patch is available and uh, we might say that the device has to be patched in two days instead of five days. And that kind of, again, improves our ability to say that the machine that we're seeing is secure. Also, our heavy use of Chromebooks uh, means that there's less data lying around on devices and just walking around the world. Uh, a third thing is that we have various efforts to improve uh, certificate theft, including attestation. And that's kind of because the, you know, um, certificate is the primary ID that we're using to be able to say that the device is, the, you know, uh, that links all the data to a specific device. And that's pretty, um, a, a difficult one that we're still working on, but you know we had a lot of other things to work on, and now we're we're kind of able to tackle this piece, and that you know is pretty crucial for us to be able to say that the machine that we're seeing is the one we think it is. So the last one that um, we've been spending a lot of effort on recently is scaling up and improving operations. So. We now have about 10,000 access rules and five to 10 times uh, our device measurements than what we originally had. And that's not something we quite planned for, partially because we had so much to do already with getting the infrastructure up and migrating people over. So now we've been fix, uh, focusing on easier uh, usability. For example, access issues were previously very confusing for server owners and engineers and end users to kind of figure out, well, like when they countered them, um, what to do. They were given a confusingly worded error code and just had to like open a support ticket and just like search and figure out like, well, what does this mean? And what am, what am I supposed to do with this? Uh, now we've changed to make those error codes more human readable and provide remediation steps that these um, end user can resolve themselves. And that kind of saves end user time and frustration and uh, turnaround time uh, and frees up support personnel to, to work on other things. The second thing is making things more self-serviceable, um, kind of like with remitting, uh, resolving your own is uh, access issues. On a similar note, we kind of, we made changing access rules easier. Before you needed a text editor and to enter interact with revision control to make access rule changes. We had different workflows for different types of access, access mechanisms uh, that change depending on what environment you're in. And that made it really hard to kind of like build a mental model of what you're supposed to do and how it's supposed to be done. So now we have created a service that has a nice user interface that has lots of hints that allows non-technical folks to more easily make access rule changes. We are also pulling in service metadata and um, user group data to kind of build a measurement of the sensitivity and risk of a change and uh, the exposure of a service. So now when service owners want to make a low risk change, um, they don't have to get a security engineer involved. And with that, we reduce the ticket volume by 86% and greatly reduce the turnaround time for service owners to manage their own um, applications. The last one is reduce and uh, essentially manage exceptions. It's really hard to see the real risk profile of a service if an exception is, um, if exception information is sharded um, in amongst various teams in different places, uh, undocumented. Um, if that's the case, like it's really hard to know what the current environment looks like and to be able to reason about like a user or a service. So we've been working on building in more automatic expirations so that exceptions kind of solve themselves over time instead of piling on and growing. So after all that, <laughs> that's a lot of work already, but uh, the work's not done. Um, Beyond Corp right now, uh, mainly applies to client to service communications. We still heavily rely on perimeter defense for service to service communications. We might have 
definitely throw in a, some, a bunch of extra walls in there, but uh, it's not the, the rosy picture that client to service communications looks like. And as I said, the work is never done. Um, the Encorp is a methodology and a new operational model, similar to when you turn on a SIM, and then you all of a sudden have all this data come in. You, you don't usually just turn on a SIM and walk away. You now need someone to keep it running, to improve your alerts, to add new alerts, and respond to those alerts. So Beyond Corp is much the same. Now that we have all this infrastructure in place, we've been adding more, adding more things and building on top of it. And I expect that will continue. So now I'll pass it on to Antara to give our key takeaways. All right. Uh, thank you, Connie. So that was a lot of information. Right? Like, it, like it was 10 years of history and technical stuff that we have been doing uh, and done in the past. But I, I just want to summarize like the key takeaways that we want you to go away uh, from this particular talk. And the first and foremost is relying on perimeter defense is risky, right? You don't want to trust uh, a particular connection just because of the network location, because we have seen over and over again on based on the attacks that we've seen that this is not a secure model, right? This is not the best out there. There has to be more. We want to basically base all our access decisions on what we know about the user and the device that they're using. These are the two major components of a trust in a connection, right? Who is the user initiating the connection and who is the device? If we can actually accurately calculate that and trust that, um, it's a big win, right? But also this requires a very dedicated and ongoing effort. So if you're going to build your own zero trust model uh, in your enterprise, we would highly um, ask you to require like exec level support and dedicated team of people who are actually working towards this, right? And obviously everybody's solution will be different, right? Google is a very big infrastructure. It's a pretty complex uh, infrastructure. So it took all this time and effort, but everybody's solution is gonna be different. So right, in your own model that you have right now, you can start incrementally, right? With whatever information you already have. So suppose if you're using VPNs, you can start like pulling in more information about the device, start calculating, okay, what is the latest state of the device? And maybe authorize and authenticate based on that state also, like incorporate that into your network. That's a big one step uh, already into the zero trust model, right? So don't let like the perfect be the enemy of your progress, right? Google infrastructure is complex than most of the infrastructures out there. We work on things from like self-driving cars to ocean sensors. <laughs> so there's a lot that is being done. So the long tail that we spoke about, your long tail could be much different and probably not as crazy as Google's long, long tail, right? So that's what we want you to take away from this. Like zero trust is the next big thing um, in enterprise security, uh, but you can always uh, start from where you are in your enterprise right, journey right now. Um, and that sums up. Thank you a lot for listening to questions.